Welcome, I'm Darren, and I'll, I'll be your guide today as I look at 1990-91 NBA hoops. And this video is going to be kind of long because there's a lot to talk about with this hoop set. It, it really is, it's a very pivotal set. There's a lot of history that goes into it, but the big thing is there's a lot of stuff that they did. And it's uh, it was an important year for both for NBA hoops, but also for the NBA, because in 1989, the NBA Hoops was created to basically be a marketing tool for basketball. That's essentially what the card set was. Prior to that, Topps had made some good sets, but not they had abandoned it, and basketball just didn't have a presence in the card hobby, but that was in large part because they didn't really have a presence nationwide. And the, the problem was, while the NBA had more of a breadth across the entire country than hockey did, hockey had a very devoted following where it existed. Basketball was a little bit better known, but it wasn't very well followed. It was There wasn't a lot of passion nationwide. And in the late 1980s, there was a big effort by the NBA to basically introduce itself to the general sports fan. And by 1989, there was a movement in all of the, the well, I shouldn't say all the sports, but in baseball and in football, there was a lot of growth in terms of cards. And basketball needed to get involved with that as well. So NBA Hoops was basically the big introduction to the, the entire world of card collectors about basketball cards. And it's not that there wasn't another set. There was. Fleer existed, but Fleer wasn't really taking it seriously. They, they were churning out cards, but they weren't investing themselves in cards. They weren't presenting the NBA. NBA Hoops, that's really what they were doing. And the 89 set was a good set. It primarily was good because it was introducing play, people to players they really weren't familiar with, with cards that were built around that. So the cards had a white border around the outside, which did a great job of framing the image of the player, and the name of the player is very prominent. This is a great way to, it's almost like flashcards in a way. So the card design was built in the right way, but the card stock was not a good card stock. The printing process was, was not a good printing process which meant that all the potential that their setup had was partially lost due to the fact that the cards just weren't well ma manufactured. So in 1990, when they launched their second set, they, they had to make a number of changes to the set because now they had already introduced card collectors to the sport. Now it was time to really dig in and turn the card set into a into a card in a way where they felt that this was truly professional like this was this was the big exciting space for for card collectors also for fans so it was doing it was pulling double duty it really was kind of a kind of a loudspeaker a psa about the nba and so this set had to it, it had to come across not just as another set it had to make a presence and that's what the 1990 set did. That was how it was built, that's what it did. And the first thing they did was hardly change the card at all. The card really is similar to what they'd done in the previous year. They still had the key design like they'd done before, but the outer border, instead of having a straight white border, they had a metallic silver border. This had a gleaming quality to it that just made the cards feel rich and luxurious. They also toned down the, the theme of the team in certain ways and enunciated it in others. So instead of having a big color box at the bottom with the team name, the color box actually advertised NBA hoops. And the name was in color up at the top, kind of tucked over to the side, but they had a big logo for every team. So now, it, still having kind of a flash card-like quality, they had a card that did a great job of presenting the player. The name was on there, it was noticeable, but now the team logo was the thing that was really standing out, aside from the shot of the player. But the shot of the player was really good. Not just because it was a little bit bigger this year, but more importantly because the production quality was really good. And the reason the production quality was really good was because of who was manufacturing the cards. See, normally when we think of cards, we don't normally think about the fact that the card companies don't make the cards. They almost never do. A card company is a marketing company. That's what it is. It's a bunch of people who sit around, they're designers, they deal with contracts, they deal with logistics, that's what they do, but they don't actually make cards. They contract that out. Somebody else makes the cards for them. Pro Set, however, decided to change that model. They decided to go ahead and become a card manufacturer. So they built a facility to make cards. 
Well, NBA Hoops, they had been making cards that were more like Don Russ, but they needed to have a higher quality of card, and that's what ProSet had built their factory around. And since ProSet was making football and was now going to be making hockey cards, they weren't making basketball cards, and NBA Hoops certainly wasn't going to be making football cards, which meant that there was no competition between the two companies. Thus, why not bring them together? And that was great for ProSet because ProSet needed to keep the, the presses running. They needed to continue to pay the staff, the rent, etc. So they needed to have the ability to print more cards. NBA Hoops came in and said, would you print our cards for us? Sure. So that meant that right away, NBA Hoops got a great opportunity to have really high quality cards made. They also got some of the quirks that came along with ProSet, which is that because ProSet was making its own cards, they had the ability to fix errors on the fly, which for people who are chasing errors was a lot of fun. For people who wanted consistency in cards, yeah, not so much. And so there are a number of errors that popped up in the NBA Hoops set for the simple reason that ProSet had the ability to make mistakes easily and to fix them. So those do show up. I'm not going to talk about those, but the ProSet cards were built with a high level of quality. NBA Hoops gain that same level of quality. So that meant that the images came out better, the card stock was a lot better, the way that the, the whole richness of the card read was built around a company that really did work hard to make that kind of quality. So NBA Hoops was extremely lucky in being able to benefit from the work the ProSet had done. And the card front, while very similar except with the gold metallic, except the silver metallic finish, while that was largely the, the same, the back was very similar as well. They still had the key design again. I mean, you may as well. And, but the biggest difference on the card back was the fact that now the outer border was a yellow color. And this is a strange move, except for the fact that it shows that somebody who really understood design was making this card. Because yellow is kind of a muted color. It gives you the strength of a border without drawing your attention. So while it looks like it shouldn't have been there, it means that somebody really understood color theory, understood how to balance cards out. It was a, a brilliant move, but it also helped the whole inner key to stand out more because now the white is more clear with that color, the muted color around the outside. And they also had the college stats on these cards, which for what these cards were was a great move. Because at this time, the NBA was still introducing itself to the world. Michael Jordan was not yet the biggest player in basketball. He was quickly becoming that, but he was not yet the person who completely dominated the sports landscape. While basketball was well familiar with him and was now getting to realize that, yeah, this guy might be the best ever. Outside of basketball, people were still kind of learning his name at this time. So... That meant that for basketball, it really had a long way to go to introduce itself. And Jordan was the, the person who was helping them along. But they literally had to introduce themselves to a whole generation of collectors who were stumbling into this set. This was the set that started basketball cards as a major portion of the card collecting world. And a lot of people, myself included, this is the set that I started out with. We learned basketball through these cards. So the fact that they had the college stats on there helped us to get a feel for what the players had been like in college and then in the pros. That translation was part of the education that we went through. And it also really helped us to appreciate the whole space of basketball, the, the career of a basketball player. So the card was pulling double duty and it was, it was doing a great job of it. But beyond just these cards, the card set itself was built to have a full presentation, to have a storyline. And they started the set off not with the regular player cards. They actually started off with all-star cards. And the all-star cards, instead of having a silver, metallic silver border, they had a metallic gold border. Very bold, very strong. They looked great. The cards are designed basically the same way. In, at the bottom, they have a bunch of stars with a, a, color a color box for the particular, whether they're east or west. And then instead of a team logo, they have the all-star game logo. And then the team logo for the all-stars was up in a star up on the side. Now, they had all of the east first, and then they had the west later on. And the east cards all have a blue theme, and then the west cards all have a red theme. That's the way that the, the two conferences were presented. 
and there are 26 cards in the set, but there are 25 players. And right in the middle, they have a checklist card, which has the two coaches on it. And the checklist card, it, it's horizontal, so it's a different layout from the, from the rest of them. But that was the midpoint, the, essentially the midpoint of these first 26 cards. Then the set kicked off with Atlanta and made its way all the way through Washington. That was a big improvement over 1989, where they just had a jumbled mess of everything scattered all over. Players, all-stars, and coaches were all just jumbled up. Now they actually laid it out so that you could see the whole league. And so you went from Atlanta all the way through Washington with all of the all the players being presented in the same way, except there, if a player was an award winner, then they had some sort of an emblem for that. And if they were a rookie, they had an emblem for that. So those would show up on the applicable players. So these are not parallels. They're not variations. That's the way that the cards just naturally came. And then after you got through the, the Washington Bullets, then you had the coaches. And the coaches were laid out in the same way, all the way from Weiss in Atlanta, all the way through Wes Unseld in Washington. And the coach cards are done the same way as the regular cards, as you would expect. And then they had a couple of checklists. And then they had they closed the set with the Danny Ferry rookie card. And it was done in a, a different way because they've got a shot of him with the ruins of some Roman building in the background. Uh, kind of superimposed. I, I believe that's the way they did it. The reason for this was because Danny Ferry, wa he wanted to go to Italy to play for a year and prep for being in the NBA. This was interesting for us because, look, with David Robinson, he'd been in the Naval Academy, so he actually had to do a tour. But with Danny Ferry, he, he wanted to just kind of season himself a little bit in Europe. And we didn't know what to think about that because at that time, as far as we were concerned, the European League wasn't very good. It would take the run of the dream team and seeing the competition they went up against until we finally started to get a feel for, these guys can play. And then the players that were coming in afterwards were really helping us to understand that the European League was good. But at this time, we really didn't think that. And so the fact that Danny Ferry chose not to join the NBA, but actually take a little bit of time and prep himself, we were a bit anxious about, is he going to be a star or not? So this was a weird card that we ran into where it was cool, but we didn't know whether to care about it. In the long run, no reason to really care about it too much, but it was very distinctive. And the set, was, that was the way that they built the set. But like in 1989, where they also had an extension set, where they had traded players and expansion players, in 1990, they wanted to do essentially the same thing. But instead of just tacking some cards on the end, they built it as an entire series too. It's still a very short set. So they did the same thing where they printed the cards and released them in packs with all of the Series 1 cards. Almost all the Series 1 cards. So in the pack, there was a larger percentage of the Series 2 cards than the Series 1 cards, but you were still getting cards from the first series in the packs, which were basically filler at that point. But there is one thing of note about this, which is that it was not advertised as Series 2. Instead, it was NBA Hoops featuring Series 2 cards. It includes Series 2 cards. That's the way that they marketed it. Very simple to tell the difference, blue boxes versus red boxes, but regardless, this was a Series 2 that was still done with the Series 1 cards. And they kicked the Series 2 off, set off with cards about the NBA Finals. Now, these cards were done in a newsprint type format. And actually, I like the idea of having black and white shots to match the newsprint concept. Do I think it looks great? No, I like the idea. So it's, it's a fun thing for, for these cards that are very different. But the last card in the group is their back-to-back -back championship card, which is designed in pretty much the same way as the main cards in the set. Then they had player cards for the coaches. Kind of an interesting thing. So if you're, if you're a football fan, the idea of a head coach having been a prominent player is pretty rare. It's a very uncom uncommon thing to see. In baseball, it's a little bit more common, but usually the good players don't become good coaches. In basketball, a lot of the good players do become coaches. In fact, it's a very common thing. So here in this introduction to the NBA, they actually did have a whole bunch, they made an entire subset showing all the head coaches who had been on teams, showing what team they were best known for and when their career was. So this, again, helped to give kind of a full three-dimensional understanding of the NBA. 
there it's a really cool concept although it's very weird to see the different teams because all the coaches had been known for playing on a different team and then they had team checklists so all 27 of the teams had a checklist and the checklist cards are a piece of art on the front and then it's a checklist of all the player cards and coaches on the card back now there are a couple of different artists who made different pieces of art for the the players so the team has only one image for each of them but some teams have one artist some teams end up with another etc and you might notice that the checklist for the cards a lot of these checklists are missing numbers and that's because when they re-released the series one cards any player who had changed teams they did not if they have a, a card in the updated portion of the set the original team that they had been on that card was not included in packs so players only would have one version of a main player card that was also the case with the all-star cards so players who changed teams they their original cards were short printed they were only in the series one packs and the all-star cards were only available in series one packs as well so that was difference the checklist also did not include subset cards so any card that of a player that did not was not re, just a regular any card of a player that didn't have the regular stats on the back is not included on the checklist and then they had their inside stuff cards and inside stuff was a really really innovative tv program at the time the the program was basically a behind the scenes look at the world of the nba so you could see how the the games were presented but you all the big thing was it was looking into the personal lives of players not in some soap operatic way but just to get a feel for for the kinds of different things that the players do in their in their regular life things they're interested showing the players as real people inside stuff was a major part of the education to the sports world of the nba and really helped to encourage the the fan base to just get super excited about it great great program and this often got tied into sports cards a lot just it was kind of a natural extension they also had a couple of don't do drugs cards and these are the cards that stand out easily the most which is good it is a psa but they had a couple of these which was a a nice little nice little reminder to kids about the the fact that there's you know kind of grounding things so that's that was a, a neat couple of cards and then they had their lottery pick cards and these are the the players who are at the front of the draft the cards are basically shots around or related to the draft itself and the cards have a it's the same design as the regular cards except they have in the border nba lottery pick that is a piece of a line of text that keeps that basically arrays through the whole border which kind of disrupts the integrity of it but still these were draft pick rookies these were the first draft pick rookies in basketball cards they then did the updated cards and then they closed out with a couple of checklists and that was the set now in 1989 they'd done an sp card not just short printed cards but a special print card which was for the nba champions the detroit pistons at the time well they did something similar where in packs they had a rookie of the year or they had an all rookie team card and the all rookie team card on the front has david robinson receiving his rookie of the year trophy and on the back it, so that's silver like the regular cards on the back it's the gold finish and they have what looks like four mini cards of the other four players of the all rookie team on the front very interestingly they do have lines of text like with the draft pick cards except they're much more muted which makes it read a lot better but they're the names of all five of the different players on the all rookie team so really cool concept how they built that but kind of like with the previous year they also wanted to do a card that was available available to collectors that was it was the same card on the front but on the card back it just has the the cutout shots of the four players on a solid gold background with the statistics for all five players and that's the harder one to get so there are two versions they're known as the stats card and the no stats card and the no stats card that's just the the four the four keys on the card that's an easy one to get the stats card that's the tough one to get now there are a couple of 
cards of note to talk about. I'm not going to talk about David Robinson's rookie card because that was already covered in 89. So it's, it, it's, it, you can look at it there if you want to know more about it. Sam Vincent, however, this is the one card where there's an actual variation to it. I mean, okay, the all rookie team card, that has a variation, but Sam Vincent was on his card. It included Michael Jordan down below in kind of a weird, weird pose. And then later on, it was a whole different image. They used a whole different image of Sam Vincent. Now, I assumed that, I always assumed that it was because Michael looks really weird on this card. The truth is that it, it has to do with the, the number on Michael Jordan's jersey. The card features Michael Jordan in his jersey number 12. This is one of the few cases where there's a picture of his jersey number 12. Now, here's the story. The team always carried a backup jersey because apparently they only carried one jersey per player. If they lost the jersey, they had a backup jersey that the player could wear during the game. 12 was unassigned. It had no name on the back. It was just there. If Horace Grant needed to wear it, if Bill Cartwright needed to wear it, didn't matter. So they go to Orlando. Jordan's jersey is gone. So he puts on that jersey and for one game, he wore 12. Now, part of what's significant about this is it's the only time he ever played significant sports in a jersey other than either 23 or 45. He only wore those two jerseys. Olympic teams aside, except this one night when he wore jersey number 12. And like I said, he already had a lot of sway in the NBA. And so he or his agent, somebody, didn't want that jersey number 12 to be out there. So they got the, the set to change the, the card image so that now most of the cards are Sam Vincent dribbling the ball as opposed to him going up to the hoop with Jordan on the card. So the Jordan card is one of the rare cases of a picture of him wearing the jersey number 12. It's, it's very unique. And then another interesting card is the Mark Jackson card, where interestingly in that game, they're sitting courtside where the Menendez brothers, who are, let's just say they weren't exactly children of the year. This card was one that totally flew under the radar until I think it was Netflix did a whole show about the Menendez brothers, the, the murder of their parents. And when that came back up, not that long ago, there was this sudden renewed interest of, hey, do you know that the Menendez brothers are featured on this card? Now they're located behind Mark, not in front. So they're sit sitting right in, in the back of the card. And when this hit, this card, the value of this card soared. I mean, there were people selling this card for $100. Uh, $100. This was long before the COVID upramp of the value of cards. Had this happened about 2021, this card probably would have been on sale for, for thousands of dollars in all likelihood in certain, uh, certain condition. But it was, a, it was a phenomenal little moment where this one card had fame for a different reason. And it was really interesting over the weeks when everybody discovered it until I guess the, the market realized there were just way too many of the cards and the card value dropped. But it's still an interesting little factoid. And like the previous year, there, there were a few things that they continued to do, including their announcer cards. So the announcer cards were once again done in the same design as the regular cards. So they still had the metallic silver finish on them. In this case, they did not use the team color on the card, which I think is a shame. I do like the black, but I, I love the fact that these announcer cards in 1989, they were fit, they fit in kind of with the rest of the team and made kind of a three dimensional quality to the whole experience of being a fan. Here, they didn't do that. They do have the logo on the back, but on the front, they just have a generic color, but they do have for the team logo, the logo for, or the, the name logo for the particular news outlet that they work for, uh, which, which is pretty cool. But like the previous year, these are unnumbered cards that were designed more as business cards than anything else. They also did another 100 stars set. This one's harder to, to get. The cards, again, were done the same way as the regular cards, except instead of using a silver finish, they used more of a bronzed finish for the, the metallic border around the outside. On the back, while the numbers are different, all of the colors are different on the card back. They have a solid white back uh, for the whole card back and the team colors are a different hue as well. So I don't know why everything is different color wise, but the cards do look wildly different than the main cards in the set. 
And while we're on the subject of doing things they've done the previous year, they also did all-star panels at the all-star game. Now, the all-star panels, they come in panels of six. So these are perforated. They have kind of a, a band down one side. And they have, they're built around three, three Eastern players, three Western players on each panel. The problem is there aren't 24 players. There are actually 25 players. So that means that you can't just make four panels and get everybody covered. So there are a number of players who show up multiple times. And Michael Jordan is one of those players who shows up on more than one of these sheets. But there are five sheets and they all have perforations on them. So you can either find them in the complete form or you can find them broken into individual forms. But unlike in 1989, these are not numbered. So it's a lot easier to tell if this is actually a perforated card or not. Whereas in 89, there are a lot of charlatans out there who are leading you on. But speaking about that, this is the good time to talk about the night sheets. And night sheets were a, a promotional opportunity to get people excited about the whole, you know, again, it's getting people excited about a league that was still coming up. And this would be something that would happen a lot. There were a lot of promotional tie-ins with sports cards for the NBA for many years through the early 90s. For NBA hoops, they did these entire sheets, usually 16 panel or 16 card slots on a panel showing basically the whole team and the coach, and then usually having a couple of advertisements featured in there for some, usually it was a large chain that has like local distribution, somebody who was basically sponsoring it. So you would get the, the whole card set, and then there were a couple of coupons that were on each panel. And it was different for every single market because every market basically made a, a tie-in with some local, some local company that wanted to do it in a different way. Usually these were given away at stadiums. So it'd be like card night, like bobblehead night or whatever, kind of one of those things. But that's not the only way you would find it. They did come, sometimes just the store itself would distribute them. I mean, they did have a coupon uh, on them. And so the night sheets are best known for being these big panels that were given away at games. But some of the teams were distributed not in big 16 card panels, but in smaller panels. So like with the Minnesota Timberwolves, they have a, a three card or a three a three card panel that is vertical, where they have two cards of players and coaches, and then one of an advertisement. Then when you go to the Lakers, the Lakers have a horizontal with three players and one advertisement. So they, they do come in different ways. Some teams are all on a big 16 card panel. Some are on smaller separated panels, but all of them do have the perforations and all of them have a coupon. And then some people like to include for a panel or a sheet, a, a promo that was inserted into magazines and the like. And this is actually not cards. It's a piece of paper printed on one side, it's blank on the other, and it has artistic present uh, artistic take of six cards. This is, it, it's just an advertisement, but some people do like to refer to it. So understand it's a piece of paper. It's really not a sheet, but it is out there. But speaking of large things, NBA Hoops wanted to wanted to take advantage of the fact that with this young burgeoning fan base that was discovering starting lineup figures and really getting, it was a, a really exciting time for a whole new fan base to discover a sport and grow with it. And one of the things that happens is you like to get posters, but you don't have to have a big poster. A large image will also work. And so NBA Hoops chose to create what they call their action photos cards. These are eight by tens and they are a big shot of the player. And then there's a color band down at the bottom with the player name. They sold these individually. So they were all wrapped in, in plastic and they, it was not hidden. So you would go through the box, figure out whoever you wanted to buy, you would buy that. And there were 22 cards or 22 photos in the set. These were not numbered. Every single one of these that you purchased on the back side, they had a send away so that you could go and you could buy your favorite team. You could buy five cards at one time. So while there were only 22 cards or 22 photos that were released in stores, you could send away and you could get five for each team a specific five. So every team, there are five players who are featured on these photos and you send away and you get the all five of them. They're all individually wrapped 
ironically, with more send away forms included, one in each one. So there were actually 135 players across the entire NBA, five per team across 27 teams, plus an additional 22 from what was released in the packs because the ones in the store were different than the ones you would get back. So you have Michael Jordan that you would acquire in the store. And then when you sent away for the Bulls, the one you got back had a different image on the front. The card back was the same, but the card front was very, very different. So that, that meant that there were 157 different action photos across the entire sport. And then in 1991, they released a whole nother set. So they had a 90 set and a 1991 set. And the 91 set is different in that they have different photos and the date down at the bottom, of course, says 1991 is the copyright. So there are two shots for every one of the players and then four shots for the players who were in, three or four shots of the players that were in the, the main set, the, the ones you got in the store, the 22 that were in the store. So understand there's the whole 1990 set and the whole 1991 set. So there are a lot of these for you to collect. And a company called Collect Books was also creating cards at this time that were kind of cards. They were little booklets with a single page in, inside of it and these were sold in boxes. They were sold four, four boxes of cards in each one. So, and it's a fixed number of, there's a checklist of all of the individual players that are featured in each box. So if you get all four boxes, you get the set. Collect a book hooked up with NBA hoops for basketball and they also collect, they hooked up with pro set in football. In ba baseball, they didn't hook up with anybody so it was just collect a book. But this, is, this was another thing that NBA Hoops was a part of. They did some design work on it. And it was, it's one of those things where it's real cheap to get because there were a lot of them. But the reason that the, they're so cheap is because not many people know or care about them. So they are probably much less prolific than the main cards. It's just that since nobody bothers to go out and buy them, there are lots of them out there. But these are there and they're really kind of cool. This is one of those things where you look at and you go, I wish the kids cared about these players because the kids would, kids now would love these. That's really how it worked. And I remember that we did love it back in 1990 when these came out. And then they also did a tie-in with a Larry Bird video game. So with the video game, there was an NBA Hoops card that looks, it uh, doesn't really look like an NBA Hoops card. It's got the parquet floor on it. Kind of cool, but that card does exist. And like I said, it was released with a video game. So it's NBA Hoops sponsored. But speaking of NBA Hoops sponsored, when the Detroit Pistons won their second championship, the Unical company wanted to do something special and they teamed up with NBA Hoops to create a special card set, a 16 card set, celebrating the Detroit Pistons championship. I'm not sure why anybody would want to celebrate that, but they did. And so they did that with an album. And so the Unical made these available and they are, you usually find them with the booklets. So they come with an album and in the album, they have four different leafs of pages for, for the various cards of the, of the Detroit Pistons championship. And the card set is done in a, it looks more like the 1989 set because this was done as more of a 1989-90, more of a 1990 release than a 1991 release. But these cards are, they're kind of cheap, they're out there. But then the next year they wanted to do the same thing. So they developed a 1991 release of cards and they didn't really have a championship to, to concern themselves with, but these cards are blue, so they look very, very professional compared to the 1991. And that brings it all to a close. Like I said, this is a pretty long video. There's a lot to talk about, but I really don't think that I can break it up and do it as multiple videos. I think it really does need to be all, done all as one. So I apologize. Thank you for sticking with, with me on this. Um, 1991 isn't gonna take nearly as long. There's not, they didn't get quite as carried away with it. But it is pretty cool to see where this, this really fundamental, this really core set came out. So if you haven't subscribed yet, definitely subscribe. Check out my other videos. I've you know, already done 89. And thank you guys for watching.